Now, if you work with RF equipment, whether it's measurement equipment or radio stuff, chances are that you are using some sort of cable to interconnect the various devices. Now, cables can be considered consumables when they are subject to constant bending and interconnections, since they slowly deteriorate and eventually break. This is especially true if they are not handled correctly. So today, I will be looking at some of the most common tests that can be done to assess if a cable is still good or if it needs changing. So if you're curious, then keep watching. The first thing that you should always do is a visual inspection. Yep, that's a cable all right. Now, in all seriousness though, you should first check for any damage to the outer jacket, so look for dents or other deformations or cuts, and you should also check the connector. First to make sure it's properly attached to the cable, but also to see if the pins are in order and clean. You sometimes get dirt in there, or the pin could be bent. Now, even if everything looks all right, the next step is to perform some basic electrical tests. So the expectation here is that both the inner and outer conductor have a low end-to-end -end resistance, and there is no electrical contact in between the two. For this task, I found that it's best to use some sort of through-hole connector, since if you try to stick the multimeter probes inside of the cable connector, you might damage it, and based on the exact cable type and its corresponding datasheet, we can get an idea of what sort of resistance value it should have. Usually the datasheet specifies a few tens of ohms per kilometer, so with a relatively short cable, unless you're using a four-point measurement, you should be measuring a short circuit, and well, in between the inner and outer conductor, you should usually get an open circuit, or many hundreds of mega ohms if your measurement device supports such a range. Next, it's time to do some more advanced tests where a VNA, Vector Network Analyzer, will be easiest to use. But other setups can also work if needed. So the whole point of the cable is to take a signal from point A to point B with minimal signal loss on the way. Therefore, the first parameter we check is the attenuation over a frequency range. An ideal cable has zero attenuation, but a real cable always has a non-zero value. And this value increases with frequency. Now, normally, this is documented in the datasheet, so you have some sort of idea of what to expect. Conversion from a default decibel per 100 meter to your exact cable length can be done easily by multiplying the attenuation factor with your custom length and divided by the reference length. Now, this is a two-port S21 test, so after calibration, the cable is inserted into the text fixture and as long as the measurement values are in line with the datasheet and there are no sudden variations in the graph, so it's a relatively smooth curve, it should all be fine. Now, in the case the VNA does not have a dedicated attenuation format, you can always use the S21 log mag and just add in a minus. Now, with a relatively short cable like this one, the frequency dependent attenuation is not that obvious, but if we swap out for a longer cable, we do see that the attenuation slowly increases with frequency. So we are getting the expected behavior. Now, there are two main mechanisms by which signal gets lost in the cable. On the one side, it's absorbed by the dielectric and the non-ideal conductors, and not much can be done about that. However, the other mechanism is by getting reflected back into the generator when a impedance discontinuity is encountered. The easiest way of checking this is by looking at the return loss parameter. For this test, we need a matching impedance termination at one end of the cable, and we measure the S11 parameter from the other end. After the measurement, we can analyze the data either in the return loss form, so here we wish to see a value of at least 20 decibels, or we can express it as VSVR, voltage standing wave ratio, and here, the value should be as close as possible to 1. Usually, below 1.2 is acceptable. Now, my VNA does not support expressing the values as return loss, but we can get that 
by just adding an extra minus to the standard S11 log mag. So we can use that. Now for this cable, I am getting a 28 decibel return loss and a 1.05 standing wave ratio at 100 megahertz. So it's pretty good. And even throughout the measurement range, we aren't getting too much worse than this. So this is a pretty acceptable cable. Now, as long as everything went well so far, means that it's probably a good cable and it can be used for further measurements and experiments. However, if something did go wrong, the last thing that you can try to do is perform a TDR, time domain reflectometry measurement, to try to find the exact point where the cable is damaged. Now, a proper time domain reflectometer is an expensive and highly specialized piece of equipment. But if you're on a budget, there are alternatives. First, you can use a basic pulse generator and oscilloscope to try to find major defects. For this, I use the T-junction to both insert the pulse, connect to the measurement equipment, and to connect to the tested cable. Then, the cable setup is similar to the return loss measurement. The cable's end has a matching termination. With the setup, we can clearly see the pulse entering the cable, and with a good cable and good termination, this is all that you will see. However, if there are any problems, like an interruption or a short circuit, then a sudden deviation appears, indicating the fault. So, based on the time delay between when the pulse entered the cable and when the discontinuity is observed, using the cable's propagation velocity, we can determine where exactly the fault lies. Just keep in mind, we are observing the round trip delay. So that's why the time needs to be divided by two. Alternatively, we can do a time domain transformation on a S11 measurement. So for this, you just do a wide frequency range measurement with a large number of test points and open this file using an S parameter viewer that can apply a time domain transformation. For example, by using the S2 VNA program from Copper Mountain Technologies. This will yield the exact same information as the oscilloscope and pulse generator setup. However, if the measurement contains a sufficient level of detail, other than the faults, you can also determine the exact cable's impedance. So the datasheet usually gives you a nominal value and a tolerance, but the TDR measurement will confirm if the exact impedance is within the specified tolerance. This particular cable seems to have a very good impedance value, less than a plus minus one ohm variation around the 50 ohm reference. However, the endpoints, the connectors, are not that great, showing impedance values of around plus minus two ohms. Now, I tried testing another cable as well with the same method. So this is a shorter cable, which I use way more often. And if we look at the TDR plot of this, we can see that it has some small issues in the middle, but the endpoints are far worse this time. So this is not as a good cable as the first one. Finally, if you have an important cable, a good practice is to also store the various verification results and compare them over time. So even if the values are still in spec, a sudden change will probably indicate that something unforeseen has happened. This can be an invaluable asset to also compare cable manufacturers or as reliability data. In the end, a cable is only useful as long as its electrical properties are in order. Once a bad cable is found, it should either be fixed or discarded. So it doesn't affect any of your measurements or test equipment. There's nothing really worse than an experiment ruined by a bad interconnection or a faulty cable. And with that said, Hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.